And it, it's only solution-focused coaching, but solution-focused coaching applied to their system of whatever it is topic, the application they want. It's solution-focused coaching. It's nothing radically different from what you've already been doing. It takes a little bit of practice. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our latest global chapter. I'm really delighted to have Alan Kay on, who's in the middle of the night in Toronto in Canada. Well, five o'clock in the morning and uh, <laughs> Christina Mule in Germany. And um, I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves and introduce today. But we're really delighted to have both of you here. All right. So, Christina. And Alan, over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot, you. John. And thank you, Alan, for waking up so early. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to turn from an OK morning to a good morning by the time we finish today. <laughs> thank you. And it, it is a, it's a great pleasure to just see so many faces and familiar faces and faces that I haven't or people that I haven't met yet, but I'm really happy to meet you. And I think, Alan, um, I, would, uh, I would say let's start by you saying a couple of words about yourself, then I'll say a bit about myself, and then we go on with uh, telling everyone what we had in mind for today. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm delighted. I say there's only a few folks in here who may not know me. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, fully recovered ad guy, advertising, long career. Uh, quit that 30 years ago and uh, been using Solution Focus pretty much ever since uh, in as wide a variety of organizations as anybody could imagine. Banks to Children's Aid is what I used to boast. And um, uh, one of the things, I'll talk some more about this in a minute. One of the things I noticed about Solution Focus is a great coaching tool, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but you can actually use it in a wide variety of what I call applications. And I'll talk also about that in a minute. Christina. Mm. Thank you, Alan. Um, I would not uh, have to add that much about myself because I don't have a huge background of solution focus like Alan has. Uh, as I'm coming from a completely different area and it's not marketing. Um, it's extremely strict and rule-based and things like this as I'm coming from audit, compliance, things like this that are extremely number-driven. Um, <laughs> but I've discovered mentoring and coaching a couple of good years back, realizing that what I did before was actually that. But after that, I started with um, formal education and I ended up loving solution focused and um, using it in a lot of other things outside of coaching um, and using it also with organizations. And I think that's the part that I've realized um, when it comes to solution focus that it changes the way people talk after that. And I think that's also what got me um, talking after at some point for the conference last, last year with Alan. And, um, that's how we ended up also being also here on screen talking about this idea of change facilitator. So what we had in mind for today was just to take this wonderful time that we have in front of us together and split it in blocks kind of like. Um, and because I think we both have a strong feeling of not doing something that it's extremely um, framework based, but a lot of let's play around with things. So we thought about it would make sense to do just a simulation, first of all, just to play around with this concept of a kitchen table conversation, or if you want to call it round table, or a way of bringing people together to talk about a certain topic and then spread it throughout the organization. So we do a simulation, all of us. <clears throat> After that, go through the 
framework, if you want to call it, what are the most important takeaways. And after that, Alan has also prepared a couple of examples that he used with other clients that he would gladly also share with you and go through them and things like this. And all of the documents that um, we show, I'm going to put them in the chat also. And John also kindly offered that he's going to um, group them together for interaction, I think. Also, what we had in mind to make things easier would be to use the mirror board. So I have one already set up. I'm going to show you also the three main things that you should know about it. And the rest, if we want to talk about mirror, we can do it separately. But I think for the, for the purpose of today, just a couple of things so we can use it. And I would not put the link now in the chat, but I will put it as soon as we start using it. So no need to worry. It will come later on. And also everything that's in the mirror board will get um, as the PDF out and will go to John so he can uh, send it to everyone. All good until now? Something that you want to change? Anything else that you were hoping for today that we should take into account now? Christina? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot to mention in my opening piece, today we're going to get a awful lot of input from folks, but also I've got some practical, let's call it, uh, examples of how you might do it. What we're also looking for, of course, is how this group might do uh, implement these ideas. The, one of the reasons uh, I always said uh, that I call these applications of solution focus, and it's the client's applications. The client wants a strategic plan. The client wants uh, customer experience, all that stuff. And in this case, uh, stakeholder consultations is the fancy word. I think there's better words these days. Uh, I, a lot of my clients call them co-creation. Co-create with the rest of the organization, co-create with the uh, uh, customer, etc. cetera. Um, uh, there's, again, there's formats that I'm going to share with you. The, the whole thing is how to get into a client organization to serve them, give them good work. Uh, and get paid, uh, other than the areas of um, HR, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. this works geared for going to line managers, executives, et cetera, et cetera, um, and takes you into further into the organization. Thank you for adding those things. And then um, exactly I'm going to link to what you were saying because what we will start also with a simulation is just going to be a talk between the three of us. Um, just to just to see how it would work in the organization and not necessarily a conversation with HR, but really uh, facilitated for a certain department, if you want to call it like that. Um, and again, the blocks would be, we do the simulation, then we go back to this framework and then we see what else uh, comes to your mind as ideas of how this could be used and with examples. Okay, cool. I've showed you Miro already. So then I think Alan, uh, John, you kindly offered to join our talk now just to have a chit chat for about uh, five, seven minutes, I would say, of um, as in a normal conversation uh, with, with this tool, um, you would take just one topic and try the three of us to think about ideas or what do we know about the topic. And that would... Um, that would be the same thing that we would do now. Um, so basically what we, we would take now as a topic is change facilitation. And I would say, so let's talk about why do you think these wonderful people are on the screen now? And what do you think they, they came here to see about change facilitation? I'll go first. John? Yeah, um, well, I, I would think that they, they've come on here because they want to get new insights and they would like to pick up a tool or two or an activity or tool, I prefer to say, um, <clears throat> to, to help them affect change in organizations. So that would be two thoughts on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, do, I do think also that one important part would be just to try out something so you can figure out how you can use it after that and have that feeling of, oh, I had it, I don't have it just on paper and I'll go like, so how does this actually work in real life, but I'll see how it, it is applied and give me that layer of, I don't know if security, but comfort to go try it out, play with it. Yeah. Alan, you wanted to say something earlier. Yeah, I want to add to that, the, and I did say it, but I'll say it again. Um, 
this is not the Allen key template of how you use solution focus for things like roundtables. This is examples of it uh, to stimulate you, uh, each of you, to take in your particular skills in solution focus uh, into other areas such as this and uh, with some obviously some practical examples from me but uh, I look forward to hearing stories of how people have moved into their client organizations and if they're from an organization um, how they do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's also one part that was uh, strongly these kind of that was one of the strong desires that we both thought of when we started this talk about this workshop of how do we show how it can actually have a benefit also well so if you if you use it what will you get out of it you know how can that improve um your work how can that improve your um services that you're offering to clients or diversify the way clients are served by your work and i think the, the multitude of applications, but also the multitude of ways how you can use the framework um, shows the power of it, shows the benefits that you can draw from, from figuring out how, how it works. And also um, it, how you reach out into the client organization um, where many people see you doing this work because uh, quite often you're doing your uh, stakeholder consultation application, uh, roundtables, whatever you want to call it, and you get to meet people in other parts of the organization, you start going, hmm, I could, I could maybe use some of that. Uh, and they're buyers. I'm being very commercial right now, but it's, it's to help the client organization uh, leverage this kind of work um, further across the organization. I, I call it the ripple effect that uh, it has a profound impact on the, on the client's organization. Mm -hmm. To demonstrate that, well, I won't demonstrate it today, but Rick Wolf, whose book I will feature later on, uh, he and I worked in a large Canadian bank for nine years on uh, customer experience, branded customer experience. The campaign still runs today. This was a long time ago. Um, and again, it was great for building our business, but it was there's visible evidence still today that it worked one, well, wonders in this company of 54,000 people. Mm. Any other thoughts from you, John? Any other ideas that came to your mind by, by listening to, to Eleanor, to myself? No, I, I, I do think it's, for me, the solution focus has to be experienced. And that's that's what I find when when I'm running workshops is people then come up to me afterwards and say, what did we do there? Because I, you know, I don't say we're doing solution focus. Um, and that's that was the most common thing. That was the way you know, it moved into other areas of world people as well. People would say, oh, well, could you use that on this issue? Yeah. OK, so, yeah, I agree with everything you've said. and. and Really, it's just a knock-on effect, isn't it? It's like dominoes. If you can, if you can get that first step. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that in there. What you just said, it it points out it also this this part of yes, you feel it, you see. It doesn't have to have a certain name because then you have to go into the details. What is it, and what is everything behind it? But as soon as you just feel it applied, then you also understand how it facilitates certain things. So, for example, how this kind of conversations or this kind of tool or way of doing things, um, it will help facilitate change because you allow for that discussion to take place and you allow for that conversation to happen. And you make sure that everyone has that feeling of they were on board with all of the of their ideas and they had a chance to express them and to understand what else is going on. So I think and it, it's only solution-focused coaching but solution-focused coaching applied to their system of whatever it is topic, the application they want. It's solution-focused coaching. It's nothing radically different from what you've already been doing. It takes a little bit of practice. <laughs> Um, true, and I think one another uh, a component that I've particularly uh, found it useful was before doing, before running one of these things is to make sure that those people that are in the, in the court talking like the three of us right now, 
you have a session to explain them or how this would work and what it is and how is the what are the benefits to make sure that they are on board and they know how to apply it properly mm -hmm. to make the effect even stronger. So I'm looking now also at the time. We had now about a 10 minutes the conversation between ourselves. Um, and I would say we just stop for the moment here. And that would be also how it uh, would be in a normal real scenario would be a conversation at the middle table between the, certain, the, the most important actors. And then after their deep conversation, it would go into different tables. So that's what we'll simulate now. And uh, we'll use the breakout rooms plus this mirror board to just simulate that, that we cannot do in real life, that everyone takes a seat <laughs> at a table and has a flip chart. We have that online now. Okay, cool. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your wonderful work with putting post-its. Uh, I'm just gonna say we take some time right now to just go through them and see what is it that you discovered. Should we just start by going through each breakout room one by an, uh, one after another? I don't know who was in number one. Uh, number one was um, Kenneth, Owen, and Yoram. Anything that you want to share from what you talked about? I see that there are a lot of things here. Use different phrases to reframe problem and so on. That would be interesting to hear what, what came to your mind. Oh, Owen, we don't hear you. Not yet. Now. Owen, you wanted to say something about yeah. that? Initially, I, I, I believe the, uh, initially it's, it's preparing for the meeting and, pre <laughs> and trying to actually uh, cover up, uh, not cover up, uh, create the environment both uh, physically and mentally where conversation can take place. And I use one of uh, Alan Kay's uh, things, uh, one of his quotes in, in stuff that I actually have read, is despite the problems, after you've initially set up the environment, despite the problems, what's working well in the organisation? And that's where I that's where I start from, and I and and then and then we pass it on basically. So it, it's it's the initial phase. I think uh, create. I think the first questions are actually important in the to actually set the direction. Hmm. So initial steps are important to set the direction and see here as soon as possible in the sense as as simple as possible. That's right, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Anyone from room two that wants to share some of their discoveries? Yeah, so um, we, we, we talked about small controlled experiments, like as mm -hmm. one of the last points, and um, fostering a culture of, of small controlled experiments, basically. So gathering heuristics to facilitate change instead of having uh, recipes that you always pick and that always work. And um, yeah, we, we also had a strong focus on language and um, uh, figuring out which words mean what when you, when you try to model or facilitate stuff with, with people. And um, I think the, the, yeah, the changing roles was something that surprised me. So I um, forgot his name, the guy from Sweden um, said, yeah, he changes roles uh, in his facilitation. So he's a facilitator or a fly on the wall and he's constantly adapting instead of picking one role and sticking with it for the rest of the, of the journey. <clears throat> like that. Hmm. Actually, could I add a bit? I'm thinking and also combining what Marco was saying and also listening to Owen. Um, I, I want to, I just keep, kept on thinking about the question. And I think um, to facilitate change, you kind of start with yourself, you know, before I even go into the meeting, before I even meet with my client or before I even, you know, think about approaching an organization. I have to check on myself. You know, what are my what are my beliefs right now? What am I, what am I uh, trusting? You know, what am I, uh, what is it my, what are my assumptions or presuppositions? And I think that's 
incredibly important because sometimes we get frustrated and that doesn't really help our clients. So we need to be in a mind frame where we can offer a safe space. And, uh, and I think that change starts with yourself really, even before we've asked the first question, even before we've entered the room. Hmm. Yeah. And, and to add on that again, um, the focus on psychological safety as a, as a most important um, thing to be set before you can actually make any change stick People need to feel safe and they need to, the, the, the psychological safety has to be maintained because it always falls apart once emotions come in, some hidden agenda comes in. So it's something that takes a lot of effort to actually muster up, but it's the most important thing, I think. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I think there's a very valuable point in there. Um, should we now also try to see what room number three collected? I'm just going to move here. Any thoughts from? I think in three, uh, Cornell mentioned something that I found very interesting in working with uh, aspiring leaders, which means they don't have any formal roles. Mm. And in that case, uh, trying to introduce a solution focused approach, like after the principle from bottom up mm -hmm. influence that he see that or experience that as I understand it uh, as something that helps you know, to go in and then actually introducing the solution-focused approach in order for them to use it. And it makes sense to that. So when they are on the floor with a direct contact with employees and all that, and using it in the context mm -hmm. of change. Mm -hmm. I see here also people process technology communication matrix, David in brackets. Yeah, David, can you tell, say something about that? Yes, I, 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 I like I like a lot of people in the group. I come from a business change area, so um, uh, we use quite a structured uh, methodology in defining the change by doing a stakeholder matrix initially to find out who's who in the zoo and how, what their impact is on the change, and then doing a uh, change impact assessment uh, where we define the change based on impacts by uh, people, process, and technology. Uh, and that helps to find what the specific changes for each impacted group. Um, and they're sort of two key, uh, two key templates that we use to, to help define the change. And then uh, working through whether there'd be, uh, for a high level change, there would be a, a communications plan attached to how we would communicate that change to those groups. And for a more specific uh, detailed change, uh, where it was a higher impact, we would use a... Um, a training plan where we do specific training on uh, what the change is and how that'll impact particular groups that are being highly impacted by the change that's been defined. Hmm. Thank you, David. That sounds very interesting. And it sounds very practical also because you give you gave also an example there. So I find it, find it useful to just have that. Okay, cool. John, you wanted to say something? Christina, could I, could I just add to that? If I may, what David was just Please. saying. Um, I think that's really important when you go into a client that you have some kind of understanding or insight as to how they currently do problem solving yeah. or how they manage change. And then to have a look at that and say, how much solution focus type work are they already doing? Mm. Probably without realizing it. So what we're trying to do is take them gradually towards a more solution focused approach by building on what they're currently doing. I think if we were to suddenly walk in and say, we're going to change everything, you know, this is a new new fad, new way of doing stuff, you're going to hit resistance. But if you can find what's working within their existing system that looks like SF and then build on it without even telling them you're doing SF, mm. the whole nature of that conversation improves. But, um, I can I just David's jump? Very can I build on that one, John? The, uh, I build it into my proposal process. Uh, the, the key briefing person, once they've told me what they're looking for and say, can I have a quote? And I say, no, uh, I'll write down what you said. I'd like to go and interview some key people up and down or across the organization and establish all that stuff you've just talked about, John. And including when you're doing change or you're doing stakeholder consultation, blah, blah, what works already? Uh, so you can build it into your process uh, becomes their process. 
If I may second that very shortly, Alan, uh, I love that one as well. Uh, I usually don't do it that early in the process, but when involving people, it's very important for me to talk about what works already. Mm. Sometimes yeah. I also go in and I just claim it. there are things working already. I know it. You just need to think about it and tell me. Because that's uh, talking about resistance, what we usually don't do in Solution Focused, <laughs> that quite often help you know, people say, ah, okay, I'm not starting from point zero. I'm actually doing something. Uh, maybe I need to do more of it, but I'm not just a completely beginner. And I find that helps also to get people engaged in a change process. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. And I really love this because we're just starting to contribute and everyone brings their own experience and their own uh, ideas. And I think that's, that's, that's a constructive and beautiful conversation. Um, should we also uh, give a couple of minutes to room four to tell us what have they discovered, what came to their mind? No idea who was in room four, but I guess somebody will remember. Just Katja and me and Jerry. Cool, thank you, Trevor. Um, Katja, Jerry, do you want to chip in or? I could definitely make a start. Um, Go. And we talked about the wonderful uh, power that language has as well, like in room two. So how the changing language is affecting um, how you behave, how you feel. And just to, yeah, support what is there as well. And now handing over to the rest, what would you like to add? I think we, um, we also um, drew the distinction between uh, intervening or facilitating in the micro system and in the macro. And the micro system is about the conversation and um, uh, sort of um, uh, inviting experimentation, but also on the left-hand side, the pink post-its are more at a macro um, level, how you would uh, intervene in an organization there. So um, building an internal facilitator capability, um, uh, training those facilitators in SF alongside problem solving and having the distinction between complex, understanding the, comp the distinction between complex change and complicated change, uh, where actually problem solving is really useful um, and com complex change with SF is, is really, really powerful too. And of course, working with the top team to determine the future perfect and how they would know we were making tiny signs of progress. So, uh, yeah. We also had um, on the right hand side in the, uh, this is from uh, uh, Jerry. So uh, creating a cadence, like a habit forming in, in the micro system of uh, reflecting on what's better and what's next. Um, and what else, what else, what else, what else, of course. <laughs> Wonderful. Then I'll take that one. I'll say, what else was there in room five? <laughs> well, I'm just calling on anyone who was in room five. But anyway, I would like to start uh, with something which is not on the post-its, <laughs> but still, so that it has depending uh, how we facilitate change is depending on in which phase the change is currently within the given organization. So of course it might differ a bit. I mean, it might shift uh, the, 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 uh, the emphasis might shift from one thing to another. So let's just start with this. And I'm asking for anyone from room five. Folks. I just went back down to basics and just spoke about, I tend not to use the word why because I find it a confrontative question for people. So I tend to use from a solution focused perspective, um, questions starting with how, what, when, um, and it creates, helps create the description too for the preferred picture as well, or what's already working. How did you do that? How did you manage that? And using lots of things like if there are some complainers or rather pessimistic people in the group, Acknowledging what it is that's causing them concern and um, using their words, using their language, acknowledging their concerns and then moving on to, so despite that, what would you rather be happening instead? And then mm. moving towards our next steps on the sign of change. 
Thank you, Michelle. It was also, it, it was also I, I like that thought of one of us in the group, which is start with the positive people. Mm. So yes, you know, as, as a starting point to, yeah, to run into the least resistance, if resistance exists at all. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I, I found it as a good, good approach as well. Thank you. Um, anyone else in room five that wants to add anything? I would like to make a comment. Uh, it's not on the it's not on the board, but I find it right now as I'm thinking about it, I find it extremely helpful for me that we should really acknowledge that people have different emotions, um, also negative emotions, because sometimes we are so focused on the positive future and preferred future and that everything will be okay and in solution focus sometimes we tend to be I tend to be uh, too optimistic maybe but not all people are like me so we need to acknowledge that uh, that the hard and negative feelings are there and what uh, that there is one very important thing for me that I have seen somewhere and I do not know the uh, the, the exact quotation but it was something about solution focus, not solution forcing. Mm. That people, uh, that, that we are not, we should not be forcing solutions and that sometimes a problem is a problem. That we, I mean, the, being solution focused, it is not about being stupid. That we, we should acknowledge that pr that are real problems. The, the thing is that we should just try to see those problems from a different perspective and that's being solution focused. Mm. Not just forcing solutions. Alan, I think you wanted to say something. I have seen you already. Well, <laughs> well, having been doing this for 20 odd years, uh, the stories I could tell, um, you know, the, uh, often what Olga was just talking about, one series I did across the country for the broadcast producers, the, the TV companies, the production people, uh, on and on and on for government policy. The government was going to change the policy, not to everybody's liking, of course, uh, but you had to work wherever you went. We did 16 centers, including a Iqaluit in the far north. Uh, you had to work with the mix of people in the room who often didn't like each other. In some places we went, they brought lawyers. Um, and you have to accept uh, initially that they're going to want to keep talking about the problem. And so you let them. I say to them, you'd like to have a therapeutic moan about this for a few minutes, let that out, and then you start moving forward. Um, uh, I've done that with lawyers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that reflects what you were saying, Olga, but you, you have to respect not only the problems they have, but their deeply embedded uh, belief in those problems. When there's another group at another table in this room of you know 50 people you've got who have a completely different perspective so you have to get that going and incidentally you've you've got three hours to get it <laughs> to get the input from them. and sometimes when people are still uh, using problem perspective or talking about problems it means that maybe they are not able to do it in a different way. So we need to respect that and and just let them, I mean, follow the, the client, yes? So if they need to talk about the problem and it is somehow helpful for them, okay, maybe we should spend some time doing that. Back to that series across the country, in, in uh, most cities we'd had, we had a, a indigenous group representation in Akala, it was all indigenous. Um, a, well, I hadn't noticed I was told about the third session we did going across the country. Uh, I, I kept citing the great stuff we'd heard from another indigenous group in La Bla City. Uh, somebody came up to me and said, do not compliment other indigenous groups. They don't like each other. <laughs> I was very glad I heard that. Uh, good learning for me in particular. But again, you still have to allow for the fact that they're deeply embedded in their dislike of each other, never mind uh, the system. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for that. And I think that's the beautiful part of it uh, that we were talking in the beginning of exactly this sharing and, and having other examples brought to the table. And I would also ask um, the room six if they want to share something with us. Yes, John and uh, Amira, would you like to jump in as well, please? Would be nice. Um, I think it's difficult to be the last room and to find something really new now. <laughs> I'm more than sure that there were plenty of things. Maybe something that we did, that we showed in our room, what we do when we facilitate change is um, ask the client to describe as, um, as detailed as possible what they really do, describe um, um, observable behavior. For example, we talked about provide psychological safety and we ask our, ourselves, how do we do that? What do we show? What do we do when we provide uh, psychological safety? It's listening, it's encouraging for opening, uh, openness, accept different opinions. Just one example. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Is there something else? Yeah. Amira. Yeah, Amira speaking. Uh, I, I would like to build on the um, points that Olga also mentioned in the discussion out of that. Um, it does not, um, it, it's not written here on the post-its, but I think uh, for me, I'm not a change facilitator up to now, but, but I hear from that that uh, the change facilitator have to have a high, high competence and capability to listen and 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 to to see all those kind of different stages the people are in when doing this kind of change facilitation right to to understand okay there are people that maybe are already on the solution focus side yeah then there are maybe also groups of people who are still maybe more stuck with the problem and um, it will not help just to push the solution focus approach through the whole um, facilitation process, but you have to have, I don't know, thousand ears and eyes in order to feel. And uh, so what is the dynamics here and how can I bring this to a useful process for the group? This just come to my mind now. Thank you for that. I just opened those. I have to switch it off so I can see also the chat. Um, and I think uh, this is the part that I noticed also before that there are a lot of other things being brought on the mirror board and that's the beautiful part of it because there's a lot of things getting collected there and we can share them with everyone. Uh, and there's something from John again, getting clear on the distinction between complex and complicating change. Important that we are not necessarily applying SF to a simple linear problem. Take the helicopter view first. But I think, Christina, just to add to that, it, it's really just saying a little bit of what Amira was saying. Um, if, if you love SF, you, you tend to walk into an organisation and want to apply it straight away. Um, if you just take a step back and go, hang on, this is a really simple problem. And there's actually, a, it's a linear problem and it can have a very easy solution. They're just not seeing it. Yeah. Um, we don't actually need to apply SF. And if we do, we could actually make it worse, not better <laughs> on a simple problem. Um, so I think it's just, just stepping back and making sure that SF is the right tool or the right approach for this particular problem uh, is worth doing. Hmm. Thank you for that input, John. This is indeed very useful to, to look at it also from that uh, bird view. Um, so that would have been more and more application around complicated and complex change. I'm still struggling with uh, the distinction. I'm, I would love to have it a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, John, you added here a picture, is it? Uh, what, one, can, I, can I share a, an image that Mark McCurgo uses to distinguish between the two? Just, uh, mm -hmm. he, he uses the metaphor of, um, uh, yeah, this is sy the Sinefin um, framework, which shows you the distinction. But another one is, is uh, that I've seen Mark use is a picture of two guys going down rapids in a kayak, which is complex change. Uh, and, and on the other side, um, the insides of a clock mechanism, which is complicated. And if the clock mechanism isn't working, it's it, because it's made up of a few interrelating parts you can identify what's causing it not to work and fix it and then off you go 
uh, whereas it's not useful to do that with the guys in the kayak. If they're going off track, they, they're clear on their future perfect, but they're just making constant small adjustments in their balance to stay on track. And that's, that's kind of a, a, another useful way of distinguishing between complex and complicated. Mm. I, could I, jump in. Another, I could give you another example. Um, if you look at Boeing uh, a couple of years ago when they were, the 787 was crashing um, and it, there was a technical fault in the 787 that they had to fix, um, that wasn't a simple problem, but it was a linear problem. And it was uh, root cause analysis was the way that, that was going to solve that, finding the technical problem with the aircraft. But at the same time, Boeing had to rebuild trust with the uh, with the aviation community, and that was a complex problem. And that really could have taken you know a solution focused approach to how do they how do they stay ahead of Airbus? How do they stay ahead of any Chinese competitors who want to send airplanes? Because there was a significant loss of trust, and to some degree still is in the Boeing company and their approach to safety. So same issue, but two different aspects of the problem, one to which SF applies and one which was more of a linear root cause analysis type of problem. Thank you so much. I'm also trying to be mindful of the time and think about how do we go through also the other components that we had in mind. Um, it's a beautiful discussion. Maybe we want to take this one upon again another time also on complex and complicated um, problems. So definitely something worthwhile talking about. Um, but what I got trying to bring everyone back to was our structure and what we were trying to do is, um, so as a simulation, we had a discussion between ourselves and everyone went in their groups and they had that rich conversation, went back and shared. Uh, probably would have been easier, it would be um, more useful once you do it in a real life setting when everyone that was at the center table can go to a table and have, be present in there and listen to those conversations. But I think it would be important if that person is just present without necessarily being judgmental or sharing ideas or taking things, just, just to listen. And after that, come back and have that main conversation again at the, at the main table. Um, our idea was to have a simulation now for another two or three minutes, but probably we need to keep it very, very short um, to, do, to, to go through a full run of that. So, Alan, do you want to share two or three ideas that came to your mind once you heard this, uh, this rich information from all of the breakout rooms? Um, just to go to that last point, I often use it myself. Uh, if you're running a nuclear power plant and there's a crack in the wall of the, whatever you call it, uh, that is a thing that gets fixed with the logic of the scientists and the construction people, uh, if you're in the same plant and a lot of the staff are uh, grumpy, not happy with the work, not turning up in time, et cetera, et cetera, that's a different kind of problem. And um, I think solution focus uh, works obviously best when it's the grumpy staff, because if you have that there in the first place, you're there's a good chance you're going to miss the science problem, which is the reactor's not working properly, um, even though the alarms go off. So I think it's reasonable to separate them. From my perspective, I always put it to the client, how can I be useful to you? <clears throat> if, and I've actually declined projects where I didn't think I was the expert enough facilitator uh, in the particular definition of the problem they wanted to fix often handed it over to somebody else. That's one point I would make. <clears throat> We're not yeah. always their experts. It's a very valuable point. And I think that that's something that sometimes goes contraintuitive, <coughs> but it's definitely useful to thinking also from this perspective. Am I the right one to take upon this, this project? John, any thoughts from you that came from listening to, to the feedback from all of the um, breakout rooms? So, um... Yeah, what came, came to mind, actually, the, the one thing was just the number of different definitions of complex and complicated, uh, tame, wicked, uh, just there's so many, and it would be quite useful to pull them together, I think, and just help people in that <coughs> way, you know, the Sinopin uh, ones as well. There is a lot out there explaining this, and it's it's really, you know, how can we simplify that? That would be good to... To help show where do you use solution focus and the one other thing i thought was i was listening to john talk about 
using, you know, when they're talking linear problems, uh, that we could, um, <coughs> excuse me, my brain has just stopped working, but um, that we could use solution focus, but in a very uh, almost micro way that, you know, just find small questions that could still help in a complicated rather than complex situation so that we don't accidentally trigger some of the emotions and, and things that are still go around linear problems. So, so you can still use SF, but you t in a very tailored way is mm -hmm. my thought. I'm not saying. And also, uh, I've often asked them, I'm um, not sure I can help you with that. What, what systems are you using? Uh, agile, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and you say, oh, tell me how that works. You know how it works. But anyway, you ask them how it works. And that's where you find, I think, what John was just talking about, the, the, the microwave. And often what, I, what helps most is getting people to just to listen to each other uh, and, and begin to formulate solutions to the linear and the whatever, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I would think I would link to that, uh, Alan, and ask you, would that be useful now to kind of like go through the steps? So we went through a simulation of how that would go, small no, breakout and one more time uh, together, and then just go through this uh, beautiful example that you had. Uh, here I, will, I can scroll in and you will see there are also some pictures from an event. Right. I want to go through this one a bit. And then yeah. we have one more. So if we do that for another five, seven minutes, then we can squeeze another breakout room on collecting some ideas of how we can use them. Sure. Um, just visually, uh, we want people literally at round tables. Uh, why? Because they can see each other. <clears throat> and, um, you know, if you put them in at long desks, they have to do all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, I've done sessions with 200 people in the room. Uh, the trick is to find what the core group is. And then this top picture here, uh, and the one below it, in fact, uh, hello. Um, uh, you tend to put the core group in there, um, particularly if you've got some outside support. Uh, the more, well, for example, when done work with listening to the customer, the customer is a stakeholder. Um, so you put them at the center table uh, and they have management staff, etc., around them. And you can use the conversation that you facilitate in the first hour or two uh, with the customer uh, to get them thinking of some ideas for progress and then uh, often what I do is I get them to turn around, literally the customers, and sit at a table uh, on the outside and have a conversation. And the research people sometimes say, you can't do that because why do you know what questions to ask? And I say, precisely. Uh, they're going to know what to questions to ask based on what was said at the centre table. Um, and uh, so it's important... There's a narrative that emerges at the center table when you're using customers and they're telling you nothing. They're not gonna tell you anything revolutionary or whatever. They're gonna tell you about some common sense stuff. Um, I've done this for movie chain theaters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then afterwards, uh, you can ask the customer to go home and give them a check. Um, and uh, the... Um, Often what happens is you've set up such a good dialogue between the customer and the managers. I have trouble getting the customers out of the room because they're talking to the management as though they're their friends. Um, so that's a nice little problem to have. Uh, but you turn to the management team, um, the diverse management team, hopefully, and you say, well, sorry, you, you can't go home because these things tend to do, get done in the evening. Uh, we've got some work to do. And you start off with, <clears throat> what did you hear that was useful? Supposing we did some of that, what would that be look like in the organization? 
uh, mm, uh, which, uh, and you break them into groups. Uh, could you be marketing? Could you be blah, 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 whatever. Um, and what would you see happening as a result of that? So that before they leave the room, they've had a conversation uh, about what they're going to do next, uh, i.e. solution focus, uh, see, some, see themselves taking some action. And it is not about writing checklists to be followed up a week later. It's to change the, uh, the mindset of uh, so that everybody's aligned on where to go with the customer. Lots of great stories to tell that tell there. Can I jump in that one for a second and just jump in? Because you said this wonderful thing with what have you heard that would be useful for you? And it just reminded me of I done this thing with um, people out of fraud examiner, fraud examiners. So this wonderful world of ones that are ending up in an organization, they have their very, very specific job in there. But um, sometimes they're struggling with being heard. And I've done this one with groups that were audit, fraud examiners, and some people that were out of business. And just to have that conversation of what's going on. And the thing that exactly in the sense of what have you heard that was useful for you, everyone that was in the from the fraud side, they went like, oh, now we got it. They don't understand what we're talking about. So they, we don't have a common language. You know, it's like we do our job because we are specialized in something and we put out that report and we always get frustrated because nothing gets done on that one, but they don't understand what we're talking about. So exactly those rich conversations that like you were saying, put the customer in the middle, and their customers were the entire the rest of the organization. And it was useful for them to figure out that they did not have a proper language to communicate their results. Hence having the frustration of nobody listening to them. And, so, and often uh, what we would do uh, is keep a small group of the staff, and we'd actually do a video interview of what they learned, what were their insights, what were their own personal actions, et cetera, uh, so that the client could, um, this is for the larger organizations, make an educational video out of it, send it across the country uh, or deliver it across the country. Um, what I'm gonna put back on the screen is here, there's more on this board. So I think that there's beautiful because there's a lot of things that come along. Um, and there's a lot of information, rich description of how this entire concept of the kitchen table conversation can be used and what's behind it and everything. But um, I would take the time that we still have to actually use the chance to go through a different breakout room. And that's here on the board. And I think up, oh, bring everyone to me. So now everyone is flying in here. And I would just like you to take a couple of minutes, five minutes, so then we can do a short also wrap up. And that would be what does that inspires you to do? So what does this entire event from this entire conversation, this entire sharing of ideas inspires you to do in the next days? But what I would start, first of all, for just a minute is to just, oh, if I find back my way to Zoom, um, to put this on the wall, so to say, and see that there are a lot of things that just uh, got created here. So, and I, John, this goes back to what we were talking now as everyone was in the breakout room, the different between, difference between complicated and complex. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> that reinforces what we were saying earlier that might be useful to have this topic of talking about it. Um, I would say for the sake of the time and for, for going through a couple of those documents that we'll share with you, I'm going to just export this uh, mural board and goes to everyone. And share my screen with this. So, Alan. Um, this one is uh, uh, written by my colleague, Rich, Rick Wolf, and I, I'm gonna give you a link to his book, which was published recently on the round tables. He, he calls them the kitchen table conversation. <clears throat> um, so this is probably something you want to read later on, uh, at least in terms of a version of uh, solution focus roundtables that he and I have produced for years. 
what's its characteristics, what are the benefits of this approach, and what process do we need to follow? Um, in uh, many, 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 many examples over the years of, uh, you know, we'll download this one to you for you to take a look at. What's the next one, Christina? What I have here prepared to share is, for example, one of the invitations. So you see what- Did you put the one for Ikaluit up? Uh, yep. This one, right? Let me see what my Zoom is. So this one? No. No, the other one? Yep. This one? There we go. Yeah. Uh, th this is a good one. Um, we're, we're, we've got the world famous Toronto Film, Film Festival here in Toronto. Uh, the folks in Iqaluit, uh want to start a film festival. This was about uh, seven or eight years ago. No, 2010, the dates on it. Uh, so what you do to get people to come to the table, and this one was done over uh, Skype, probably, in those days. I'm not sure. Uh, group in Toronto, group in uh, Callaway. Uh, so your invitation it has a kind of simple statement, creating a unique film festival for a Callaway. Good. What works best in today's film festival environment? What makes a film festival act attractive to its audience? Uh, some, if this was written by a newspaper headline writer, they would have made it a problem to get people involved. What you do is you... you you put the topic in a solution focused way. Then you talk a little bit about what, why we're doing it, but then you go to the questions. Uh, we have a number of areas to discuss. You know, you don't dream up those questions. Uh, what you do is you have conversations with the client, uh, the key people about what areas would be most useful to them. Uh, and then you draw that list up and then this is the important part. You do not use it like a focus group where you have to go through them all one at a time. Uh, you go around the table with each question and you take, look, this is just a discussion theme. Uh, let's not get hung up on uh, any one particular question. Oh, and by the way, when you're discussing that particular, feel free to disagree. What we need is disagreement. We don't need debate, but we need disagreement uh, in order to make it a richer conversation. And so that's a great example, and it was very successful uh, of the two groups, the, you know, the senior leaders uh, at, at uh, the film festival, and then the leaders in Iqaluit. We had people um, who were interested in, this, in providing funding for all of this, uh, and a very rich conversation. So that's a good example of how you put an invitation together. You don't want to be leading the conversation too much in the invitation. Uh, but you do want to know what your key client wants as an outcome of the conversation. Remember, we don't go into solution-focused conversations presuming we know what the question is or what the problem is. Um, but the, you, you build a link there by having the client tell you what that's likely, what would be more useful, useful to them. Uh, Christina, I'm work, watching the clock. Are we? Can, can, let's go to the last one, um, the, the, the book. Wanna put the link in the chat already? Uh, yep, I could just quickly, I'm not pitching the book, I'm just saying it's a very good book and it's fairly current. Give me a second. Um, I need to share my screen, but I need to find my way back to Zoom. Um, where is my window here? So this this one you mean? That one. So uh, this is the guy with whom I worked for nine years at a bank, uh, including in England, the, the British bank, British um, part of the bank. Uh, he calls it the kitchen table because it's the descriptive of what we do at the kitchen table. We come to share ideas, we come to disagree, uh, but we can also come to move forward. And so um, he's used that one for a long time. Uh, today, Rick calls them, because a lot of them are done on Zoom, um, digital campfire. <laughs> what a wonderful way to put it. Um, and so uh, 
that book will give you a link. Can you just scroll down a bit? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's the content. Huh? Yeah, there's tons of great context and content in there. I would really love to see a similar meeting that we had today, like in a couple of months and say, so have you tried it? How was it? What is it that we can learn and how it got? shaped and formed based on your individual approach and i think this 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 wonderful word that svea is using always as your signature <laughs> how did everyone put their signature on this one hmm. magic conversation between uruguay australia and france this is the beautiful part of having such an international community and having the opportunity now to do everything like this when we meet often and I'm really really thankful for that John I think it's a brilliant thing that SFIO achieved to have this uh, international mixed conversations and everyone just sharing ideas and thoughts and experience cool. thank you and uh, I'd just like to end up with saying a big thank you to Christina and Alan for bringing your experiences to us so uh, and your own you said a, a, a we should have a hug, so I don't know how the emoji is like this, isn't it? So, <laughs> so we'll do a hug emoji if you want to. Um, and Perfect, Alex. Yeah, really just want to say a big thank you to all of you as well for coming in and joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. All right, so thank you very much indeed, and have a fantastic week. Thanks.